Welcome back to the Fire Break. I'm Steve Wolf. As you know, the Fire Break is sponsored by Team Wildfire. We're developing innovative technologies for mitigating the most dangerous effects of wildfires. I've got with me today Robert W. Gray, who I've been following on LinkedIn for years, reading his articles about uh, fuel mitigation and things we could do to you know, try to knock down some of this fire problem that we're all having. Uh, right now, he's uh, with us live from uh, up north in the country that can't keep its smoke to itself. <laughs> and uh, Robert, welcome to the fire break. How are you today? Good morning, Steve. Good morning. So wh where's the, why can't we get a smoke curtain? And we usually think of a smoke curtain as something that obscures us from something we don't want to see. We just want a curtain that, that, you know, keeps the smoke from coming down. Well, I mean, you look at a map and, you know, once you hit that 49th parallel, there's nothing on either side of it. So when, when you're looking north, there's nothing there. And we look south, there's nothing there. So we assume smoke stops there. Yeah. So, so the, uh, now, now that uh, Canadian smoke is impacting the U.S., does that give the U.S. a greater incentive to help with the wildfire mitigation? Uh, well, we actually, we had a lot of help this summer. Uh, I think we had almost 2,000 firefighters from the U.S. up here and Thankfully, you guys had a very slow season. Um, otherwise, we would have been in a world of hurt. But, you know, thank you so much for the resources you did send. And, um, you know, on the issue so of smoke. If we sent 2,000 firefighters, that, that almost, that doubled your fire for fighting team, right? Almost. Almost. We maxed out at yeah. about 3,500. So. Okay. Yeah. So when you get a big fire, you're really stretched pretty thin. We are, we are, we, we have a capacity problem for sure. Yeah. And is that a, a labor issue or is that a uh, difficulty with availability of hiring or just not, not making a decision to bring more staff on budgets? Um, it's probably a combination of all. Um, we rely heavily also on a contracting force. And um, if you don't feed that contracting force with work the rest of the season, they're not available during fire season. So that's part of the problem is fuels management is a, you know, 365 day a year job. And we're not looking at it that way, which is part of the problem. I see. Yeah, right. When it's fire season, everyone's thinking about it. And the rest of the time, thinking yeah. about something else. So yeah, let's just... back up a little bit and, sure. and tell me what is what is fire ecology? Yeah, that is your title, fire ecologist. So, oh, what's, wow. so what is, what's entailed in that whole realm? It's, an, it's, a, it's a scientific discipline where we, we try to understand um, the impacts of fire, the fire, relationship of fire with, with our environment. It's, uh, it runs the gamut of fire effects to fire behavior, understanding fire regimes, you know, what does, you know, the sort of the, the, the pattern of fire in the landscape. Um, we also look at, um, you know, historic conditions and current conditions, impacts of climate change. So fire ecology is a very wide field and within it, there's subdisciplines. But, you know, as a fire ecologist, we run the gamut of understanding fire effects, the relationship of organisms to fire, uh, the relationship of human systems to fire, all those things. So it's really very comprehensive. It's very comprehensive. Uh, I, I've been in this field for 40 years and I'm still learning so much. So it's, uh, and, wow. and now there's a, there's and, a big and you're a prolific writer, are you not? I, I do write a fair bit, yes. <laughs> yeah, and I've been, you know, enjoying your articles for half a decade now. So yeah, I guess I probably missed a lot of the early material and I'll have to go back <laughs> into the article. It, um, the thing is though, it, it keeps repeating itself because we're not solving these problems, Steve. <laughs> right. <laughs> History like fire. Right. Yes. Cyclical. So, so, but on that point, you know, if I were to go back in the archives and see, you know, the read about the prior iterations of the current problems that we didn't solve the first time, mm -hmm. um, how much of that would apply now based on the, the change we've seen in the climate and the nature of fire? Within the last several decades, if you wrote something 20 years ago, for example, about the kind of mitigation that we needed to do, the magnitude and the scale of it, uh, and you fast forward it today, you'd be writing the same thing. You might, you might amp up the magnitude a little bit, but the things that we identified we needed to do 20 years ago, even 30 years ago, 
they still apply today. Uh, we're just, we just haven't done them at the right pace and scale. Okay. So the empirical formulas are the same. The quantities are different. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, and it's, therefore it's, the impact is considerably yeah. different. So what yeah. are some of the strategies that you recommend for fuel mitigation? Because, um, science probably has its point of view. Politicians have their point of view and, you know, never the twain shall meet often, unfortunately. Um, but yeah. in terms of the science, you know, what, what actually works and mm -hmm. what's feasible? Yeah, those, yeah, that's a good way to, to sort of parse it out. What works is um, we've, we've done a pretty good job of looking at those historic patterns. You know, part of fire history and fire ecology is looking at past patterns on the landscape and, and um, what did fire look like and what were the, what were the consequences on those historic landscapes. And we found that fires, there were a lot of fires historically pre-European contact. And there was so much fire that each fire burned a small area because they kept running into areas previously burned. So we have this distribution okay. of fire size and that gave a landscape that, that basically resulted in a landscape that didn't support these large kind of mega fires we're seeing today. So that's a, that's a useful template. So we fast forward to today. Okay. So what does that mean? We have a landscape today where fire can go wherever it wants because there are no interruptions. Some parts of the West we burned enough that there are speed bumps in the way, um, but other parts, other parts of the West, we just you know fire can basically do these you know two hundred thousand hectare runs, and so part of what we have to do is reestablish that pattern. Now, scientifically, we've done a lot of modeling. There's been quite a few papers written on this, and you're looking at probably 40 to 50% of the landscape needs to be in vegetation composition and structure that produces very low flame lengths or impedes fire movement. At that critical threshold, we start to see area burned at high severity start to really decrease and all the attendant negative consequences of high severity fire start to decrease too. That's the science. Now, to get there from a policy economics sociology perspective that's a trade-off analysis you know so that means if we don't do this here are the consequences if we do do this here are the consequences both positive and negative it's going to cost money if we don't do it for example you know the commerce department i think it was 2017 issued a report the economic burden of wildfires in the u.s is 74 to 350 billion dollars a year so we weigh that against the cost probably be bigger, right? It's probably be bigger, you know, uh, here in Canada, especially in BC, where we had 2.4 million hectares burned, we spent a billion dollars on suppression. Um, BC is not a big problem. So it's 5 million people here. So if you continue to have these horrendous, very expensive catastrophic fire seasons, it's going to start to impact the budget. It's going to impact every ministry's budget. And so this trickle down effect that, you know, the pushback that we usually get is, well, it's going to cost too much. It's going to cost more to not do it. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, uh, I guess that's something common on both sides of the border is, you know, no money for prevention, endless money for response. Exactly. We, we saw that this year for sure. We see it every year. Right. Yeah, because no, nobody asks what it costs to, to save the community once it's on fire. Right, right. So right, and uh, penny wise, pound foolish. So, so yeah. what are the strategies? Are we are we to thin? And 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 just, I'm just curious um, if you have this continuous uh, canopy now that you know wasn't the case you know, pre what you called European contact or <laughs> we who messed the land up um, <laughs> and it all burns, then when it regrows over the next 10 to 30 years, mm -hmm. um, it's just replacing exactly what was there. So yes, you, you would think you would want it to burn, you know, in alternate chunks, not all burn at once and then all come back at the same time. Yes. Is there yeah, that, that's anything a, to yeah, that? So yeah, the, the, the spatial arrangement of these things is really critical. And like I said, you know, historically, the scale was 
was quite small. You know, the average patch size was was less than 80 hectares. So so fires were were burning at the sort of patch size scale and it would run into something that didn't burn again. So we have to break up the continuity of fuel. Fire is a contagion. It's, it's like a virus. It's going to go wherever there's a susceptible host. So we have to inoculate the landscape and break up this, this sort of continuous contagion condition. We do that through um, modified suppression. You know, when we have those fire seasons where, you know, conditions aren't so bad that we can mon basically monitor fires and sometimes sort of steer them around. In the north in Canada, especially Parks Canada, um, Wood Buffalo National Park is one of the largest parks in the world. And their suppression apparatus is a helicopter with either helitorch or ping pong balls. And they just steer fire, you know, into recent burns or into deciduous patches and things like that. So, so that's definitely one of the strategies at hand. Um, thinning either manual or mechanical, commercial or pre-commercial, basically removing lots of biomass is really important doing a clean job with it is really important. You know, it's, it's the tops and the branches and everything else that needs to come out. Um, thinning alone has some benefit. It'll keep fire out of the crowns, but you'll still lose the stand in most cases. It'll scorch kill the stand. So if you want these stands to maintain, to be alive and be resilient, you have to thin and then prescribe burn uh, or you cultural burn, which is, you know, different set of objectives, but similar outcomes. So, um, and that's been that the science really supports that. I mean, there's been a couple, there's a paper just came out this week from the Sierras and they looked at the fact that thinning and prescribed burn worked even under extreme weather conditions. So that recently has been a little bit of a pushback. Well, it doesn't work, you know, with these extreme conditions because that's what we're kind of get, you know, in the future with climate change. Well, this paper showed that well, actually, no, it, it will work under extreme conditions. We actually don't have a lot of examples where there's been a lot of it on the landscape so that we can really test a large scale juxtaposition of these things with extreme weather. And I would expect that if we have more of the landscape treated to these conditions, even under extreme weather, we'll see a, a positive benefit. So the prescribed burning is really key. Um, removing the biomass is important. The problem then becomes the smoke with the fires. And what do we yep. do with biomass that in a lot of cases is junk? It, it doesn't have a lot of value. So we have to look at different markets. So market solutions are a big part of this too. Toilet paper. Toilet paper, pellets. Um, you know, making, yeah. uh, making energy and heat from them. You know, replacing coal. Right. So you still end up burning it in that, in those cases. Yeah, you do. But I'm, I'm part of a project up here called the, the wildfire uh, and carbon project. And uh, it's being led by Pacific Institute for climate solutions. You've probably seen some of our posts on LinkedIn and we, part of what we're looking at is, you know, the scale at which we have to do things on the landscape, but then knowing we're going to have all this biomass and it's junk biomass. So what do we do with it? Well, the bioeconomy, so if that can displace fossil fuels in the production of electricity and heat, it's actually a gain because they're, they're less carbon intensive than a similar quantity of fossil fuels. Right. Um, the other thing okay. is you can grind it up and you can make dimension lumber out of it. It's engineered wood products and it's yes. stronger. You can impregnate it so it's not flammable. So it's a great building material for multi-story buildings that are less fire prone. So there's all these things, but displacing a regular spruce two by four, it's a more expensive product. So, you know, if we're looking at, you know, greater good for society, do we add a, a tax to that, you know, typical traditional dimension lumber thing to make it less competitive than a lot of things we have to start looking at seriously here that are outside the box. Yeah, right. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. Now, how, how do you treat because when you know when I watched the Marshall Fire here from my window, uh, and I noticed you know when the, when the houses burn, they tend to generate a lot more ember cast than when the trees burn, and presumably that's because of Building the nature of the wood products in there, the OSB and and, and other things, which. Are you saying that they they weren't treated the way they could be treated because 
what we saw is that they were extremely flammable and amazing ember brand uh, mm -hmm. sources. Yeah, the, 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 there's there's a really large quantity of science now in, in you know proper building materials and IBHS Institute for Business and Home Safety out of University of Maryland does a lot of fantastic stuff. You can see their videos about you know hurricane proof homes and fireproof homes and it comes down to the building materials. Um, um, that's a big focus of the FireWise program in the States and the FireSmart program up here, but um, easier said than done. I mean, it's, it's easy to set bylaws and standards for new home construction. You know, you have to meet this, this base level of the proper building materials. And of course, landscaping becomes a part of it too. But for all those millions and millions of existing structures out there, it's expensive to make yeah. those conversions. So we had this fire, the Fort Mac fire, which was John Valen's book this summer. And um, Canadian Forest Service did some research afterwards on building materials and building back better. And just the roof siding, the roof bay window and decking. So just replacing those three was anywhere from 17 to $30 a square foot. That was in 2016 dollars. So a 2,200 square foot home. Wow. That's thirty-five to sixty-five thousand dollars just to replace those three elements, and, and oftentimes it's more than those three. So, you know, if you're a uh, if you're a couple on retired income, fixed income, um, you can't afford that. So, no, you know, your best bet then is to get your your upwind neighbor to do it. Exactly. Exactly. And and there's they're, more they're science than the match that lights your house, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then, and there's you know, there's some emerging science about fire flows through communities and things like that. So you can be more strategic. Yep. Okay, this neighborhood needs to do this, this neighborhood, lower priority, lower tier or something. But yeah, but it's and still these perimeter homes, right, are the really the key. That's the barrier. Yeah. And, and what about beyond that barrier? What beyond those perimeter homes? Um, are we applying the same zone concept? to neighborhoods that we are to individual homes? It's hard to say, Steve, you know, each, and each community is different in how they apply, how they write bylaws and how they affect planning. Um, groups like Headwaters Economics, they do a lot of work in this and, um, you know, they they probably have a couple documents written on it, but I, I tend to focus my efforts on the wildland and, and issues with fire effects on things other than communities, but it, we, we certainly have to be aware of it, so. So, so for mechanical means of fuel reduction, um, which is really fuel reduction, really not fuel treatment, um, to what degree is that feasible in the great wild outdoors, you know, where it's not in anyone's city jurisdiction to fund it mm -hmm. uh, versus the areas that are immediately uh, surrounding cities where they might be more interested in doing that if if they thin around the city but they don't thin you know 40 miles away excuse me 80 kilometers away um then yeah they're still going to get the smoke exactly but, but maybe not the fire. yeah so i, I and are we now finding that the smoke is really the real uh health threat yes the big health threat is smoke um, there's, there's a new paper being published. It, it, it appears like once a week and it's smoke is bad on, from this perspective and this perspective, and this perspective. So smoke is one of the biggest issues and it's not just the particulate, but it's also the carbon. So, um, you know, so we really do have to get a handle on the smoke, which means at that larger scale, it's taking that, you know, we don't want to eradicate fire, you know, area burned per year is not the issue area burned at high severity. That's the issue. That's, that's the consumption. That's the emissions that come from that. That's what we have to do. So it's, it's defueling the landscape. Um, and it has to be at a large enough scale. So whether it's tucked in close to the community or it's, you know, 40, 80 kilometers out, um, we have to do both, but we have to do it at the right scale. And it's, we're talking about removing billions of tons metric or imperial of biomass and, and doing something with it. So that's, that's the task. Build more boats. 
build more, build, build more buildings, you know, produce build more, more buildings. Right. Uh, <laughs> so there has, you know, and I say that because there's, there's a push now to, you know, build more with wood Yes. because then houses become carbon sequestration devices yes. uh, rather stable. than just the trees. Stable right? carbon storage. When you, yeah. when you capture, when you take the wood and you put it into something that serves a purpose for a long time, you know, that carbon's here. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and captured. So there's also, uh, you know, I see in the venture capital funded areas, um, you know, more and more people making pitches to try to get funding for their carbon capture and carbon sequestration technologies. Mm -hmm. um, am I wrong in thinking that that's a bunch of crap and that there's no more effective carbon sequestration technology than a tree and there never will be? Yeah, it would appear that a lot of the you know, carbon, we're carbon and we're going to pump it down into rocks underneath the ocean. And, you know, what's the, the technology of that versus you know, plant a tree, a yeah. completely solar powered carbon sequestration technology that runs on the on sun and rain. Yeah. Uh, and turn, you know, hundreds of, you know, tons, multiple tons uh, mm -hmm. per tree of carbon into tree. Yeah. If we if we don't uh, solve the. Um... The forest resilience issue, which is basically we need our forest to survive, whether it's fire, drought, yeah. insects, they're all related. If we don't create that, then we're stuck in this doom loop of more fires, more extreme fires, more emissions, increasing uh, global temperatures. It's, it's a positive feedback loop. And the way out of it is we reduce emissions by making our forest more resilient to disturbance, primarily fire. That's, that's what causes the emissions. So that's the key. Now, up here, um, the, the federal government has this $2 billion planting program. And, um, you know, when you're, when you're asked about the efficacy of something like that, you have to really kind of be serious and look at it and go, I don't know of any place in Canada right now outside of the west side of Vancouver Island where you could plant a tree tomorrow and it'll be alive in 100 years to count as a carbon offset you know, we're, we're burning at the rate across Canada where um, the fire cycles are going to be in most cases far less than a hundred years. So, you know, where we plant becomes critical, but more importantly, instead of, you know, just this massive replanting program is make our existing forests more resilient, thin them, um, shift to hardwoods versus conifers, you know, species like quaking, quaking aspen in the States or trembling aspen up here, closed stands of aspen of a certain stage and structure will stop fires. I mean, I, I fought fires in the U S and we, we used aspen stands as safety zones, you know, well, New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, places like that. So, so that, that should be our focus is instead of, you know, this massive ramped up planting program is let's, let's make our forest more able to withstand disturbances stable carbon pools and there's so many other benefits from it too from a water perspective and hydrology to air quality and all that so that should be our focus and this is all written up in uh recommendations numerous a manual of it <laughs> right and op-eds <laughs> an op-ed oh how sad I, that's the extent of our trying to influence government these days steve it's it's op-eds Wow. Uh, that's sad. Well, I mean, I think a really, but a, a lot of people really do care about this problem and do want to solve it. Yeah, um, they do. They just don't know what to do or what they should be asking of the politicians or what policies they should be endorsing and demanding. Uh, yeah. So w what's, what's really the best way to, to summarize, both to summarize what the policies look like and to get support for them? Yeah, so we, we talk a lot now about, you know, the need for transformational change. So um, that means, you know, out with the old and with the new. We're, this this is a crisis of proportions that, you know, in some of our conversations is, is not that far removed from how we tackle fascism in the 1930s and 1940s. It was an all of society, all of government approach to deal with this existential crisis, which was fascism. And so this climate crisis and fire is a huge part of it. Uh, it means that we have to look at 
um, our economy differently. So we, we talk now about, you know, billions of tons of material we have to do something with. Well, that means displacing something. We don't do that very well in a market economy, you know, because, you know, whoever sort of produces the cheapest product, you know, wins the day. This means actually the government sticking their hands in the market and, you know, doing things like this and nationalizing industries and doing things like that. If we're going to be serious about solving the problem, that's what we have to do. And boy, as soon as you mention that, people's hair goes on fire in the whole bit. It's like, okay, well, explain to me how it's going to work otherwise. Because, you know, we have to look at things very, very differently. And we're going to have to pick winners and losers. And if our end goal is to arrest this problem, then there's there's a limited things we number of things we can do and how we do it. So that big transformational change is, is required. But it's happening at a time when there's significant distrust in institutions to solve problems. And we're also asking institutions to make the big, the big tough decisions. We wrote an op-ed in the Globe and Mail, which is sort of Canada's New York Times a while ago. And we talked about, you know, um, hard, doing the hard things, you know, it's sort of like Kennedy's speech about, we're going to go to the moon, not because it's easy, but because it's one of those hard things. Well, making this big right. adjustment is a really hard thing. And political parties themselves don't do that because it scares people and you're, it leaves you, it leaves you open to attack from the opposing parties. And so you do the easy things. That's not going to work. We're, we're going to have to really do some big, ugly things that are going to be inconsistent. We're going to require sacrifice across the society. And that means that, People do things altruistically and not because they want a career in politics or something. So I don't know if I'm making sense, but we have to do these really. Yeah, big well, it's things. funny. I mean, you, you talked about fighting fascism uh, as a corollary to the type of changes that we need. And yet, you know, fascism would be the form of government that could uh, mandate the changes that would be necessary. That, I'm, not, I'm sure that's not a, tr a trade off that we want to make. But we really do no. need uh, informed leadership to say, hey, nobody's going to like this. And this is what we're doing exactly. uh, because we have children and grandchildren. And these are sacrifices that we have to make for them for the future. Exactly. And, and so whether it's, you know, playing the family emotional card or something, it, it sounds like, you know, the, the science is what it is. And now for the science to come to life. It's now it's a marketing problem, mm -hmm. uh, n not a technology problem. It is. So we, we know what to how do. How do you? Yeah. Right. We know what to do, but it's it's a very unappealing solution to a lot of people, and it's really disruptive uh, to the way economies and consumerism works right now. Mm -hmm. um, so, how do you sell it? I, we have I guess if you knew, if you knew, we wouldn't be having this conversation, right? It would, exactly, Steve. But, we, 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 um, we've tried. We haven't given up. It's sort of like a chess game, you know, you move and counter move. And we're, we're talking about, you know, planning a symposium this year. And we, we have elections coming up here in B.C. And it's an opportunity for the four political parties to get up on stage and say, OK, if you form the next government, how would you solve this problem? And um, we'll see if we get we get them all there first. But um, we do you do you educate the public more? You know um, what we we don't know what the answer is, Steve. I mean, we're trying everything, and so far it's you know we haven't really gained the traction that we want. Is it uh, is it more peer reviewed papers? I don't think so. Is it more white papers no. and opinion pieces? No, that's not going to do it. No, it, it's more, you know, celebrities espousing the conclusions of what the public needs to do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and then people saying, I, you know, I want to do what Michael Jordan said to do right now. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, that's that's a sad day if that's what works. So, you know, do we spend more well, time on TikTok? But, you know, that, that, that's the place where science has to learn from you know, the marketing that's been successful for every other brand or every other mission yeah, is right. You, you have to make it popular yeah, uh, and you have to give people a reason to want to do it because ultimately 
uh, absent of fascism, uh, people just do what they want to do and they don't do what they don't want to do. Exactly. So for this to work, you have to make people want to do it. Yep. That's the task. And, you know, and give them a reason. And, and, you know, even with, uh, within your own community, you know, there's always this pull between, you know, what I know I should do and what's best for the planet. Mm -hmm. Right. It, it would be best if, you know, you never got on an airplane to go to a conference, you know, exactly. because of the, you know, the impact of that. However, things might come out of that conference that would greatly offset the, you know, the carbon footprint of your flight. Exactly. So we're always, you know, making those trade-offs and, you know, thinking, hopefully thinking about them. Yeah, um, yeah we are. So, if, so let, let's, let's say the crazy idea, but let's say government doesn't respond uh, because it's unpopular. Okay. What could, what could individuals do, you know, in their own, what, you know, what could I do right here in the way I run my house and my, my life where I could have the, the right impact. I probably not going to fly North and, you know, get my chainsaw out and come thin timber with you. Uh, but are there, you know, are there changes I could make that, that, that have a similar influence? Yeah, it's, it's, um, at the individual level, whether it's conservation or something, um, you know, you can do what you can, but it's not going to have the, the scale. It's not impact do what we need. needed to do. Yeah. It, it's, 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 so when you talk about thinning on what scale are you looking? Because if you, if you fly anywhere, which I bet, I bet you do, Mm -hmm. you, know, you look down and you see, oh, my God, this planet is like wall to wall forest uh, with, you know, micro pockets of cities. Mm -hmm. uh, we could barely thin the perimeters around cities, let even let it even imagine what it would take to do, you know, the large scale thinning mm -hmm. um, that would allow stands to burn without affecting, you know, the entire canopy. Mm -hmm. um, where do you start? We have, we have a lot of fancy models that we can use to sort of, um, uh, characterize fire flow where it is, you know, with prevailing winds, even under extreme conditions, where is fire most likely to go? And if we do it, sort of do it, you know, probabilistically, we can see time and time again, this is where fire is likely going to go, you know, under these sort of conditions. That gives us an idea of where to prioritize our treatments. It also gives us an idea of the scale. So, you know, if we're going to interrupt this pattern, this is what we need to do. We start with 20%, did that work? 30% did that work? We're going to find some, we're going to ramp up. We're going to find some sweet spot where this works. Anything beyond that's kind of excess. We need to move to somewhere else. So we can do that prioritization and parameterization to find out where we need to do things. And what we're finding is, the scale of treatment needs to match the scale of disturbance. And then you start to see that scale of disturbance start to decrease. And it doesn't have to be all thinning. It can be a range of things, you know, so we've looked at, you know, um, a lot of BC is very mountainous topography, um, incised canyons, the whole bit. Well, we can use harvest systems because BC has a harvest footprint of about 130,000 hectares a year. So that's 260, it's about 330,000 acres a year. So harvest where you can and then apply prescribed burn from that up to the rocks. That creates this nice vertical pattern of reduced, you know, basically reduced fuels. So there's a lot of things that we can do. We, we, we rehabilitate riparian zones. We rehabilitate meadows. We get beavers back in there to do all the, the things that they can do. So we add in that benefit to it. We tie into some rock or a lake or a reservoir or something. So there's all these additive measures that we can do that multiply the effects of individual treatments. So that's all part of the optimization modeling that we do to figure out what do we need to do? And then where do we need to do it to have the greatest effect? So that's, that's what we're gonna have to do. So are you at least beginning the mission from a perspective of consensus do like fire ecologists around the world like they're all on the same page about uh, what what the action plan needs to look like 
Yeah, and, and beyond fire ecologists too, to you know, to fire scientists. You know, as a community, we are very much on board with what to do. Obviously, different jurisdictions, there's some other constraints and things to consider. Different fire regimes, of course, different climatic conditions. But you know, as a, as a group and as a network and a you know peer group, we we have a really good idea what needs to happen. So we we are very much united in that. And how much money do you need to do it? It's a good question. You know, that's all part of that analysis of is it twenty percent, thirty percent, forty percent? What combination of things? It's not going to be cheap. You know, it's going to cost billions. It's going to cost hundreds of millions to billions per year to do it. It's going to have to be sustained. Vegetation is dynamic. It grows back. Once you do it, you don't walk away forever. Um, so, but as we talked about earlier, when you're looking at, you know, the economic burdens between 75 and 300 some odd billion dollars a year, even if you spent a billion dollars a year, you're still so far ahead. You know, you're, you're paying down right. this future cost. Right. So it's a, it's a matter of getting people into long-term thinking versus election cycle thinking. Exactly. Yeah. And it's, you know, part of that, part of that conversation has to be Canada needs to have this conversation with the U S we are, as you mentioned earlier, we're sharing fire effects, which is smoke. Uh, but we're also starting to share fires back and forth across the border. So here in BC, we've had a fire from Washington state came across the border. One of these years, we're going to have a fire under a dry, cold front. It's going to make a run into the U S and take out a U.S. community. That's not going to be good. But the other thing Buffalo is Buffalo or something yeah. upstate New York. Yeah. Like it was pretty well threatened last yeah. summer. And, and here in the West, it's the same ecosystems. I mean, it's dry ponderosa pine, Douglas fir, it's lodgepole pine, spruce. It's this, we share the science, we, we network, we, we, we collaborate on papers, you know, that border doesn't exist when it comes to the ecology of these systems. So, you know, if we're going to remove massive amounts of biomass here in Canada, we need a market for that. Well, that means talking to our nearest neighbor who still has several hundred coal fire utilities, have that conversation. Talk about the softwood lumber agreement, which right now is just, it's a constant nuisance for both countries. So we have to have this conversation across the line. Internally, we have to have conversations within political parties, the fact that they need to work together to solve this because not any one of them within one term in government can fix it. You know, so we have to have long-term multi-generational solutions to this and we're not doing that. So that's part of that transformational change that needs to happen. One, one way that they've addressed, you know, a similar issue in the judicial range uh, in the states, right, is we have the Supreme Court where you're appointed for life. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you can that that gives you the freedom to make unpopular decisions uh, because you're thinking about the longevity of your choices. Right. Uh, so perhaps the the budget for these you know wildfire mitigation and fuel reduction acts should be implemented by people who have a you know a long-term appointment rather than by the people who are elected every few years right so you right you put that panel together you say look you your, your jobs are not in danger this is a a lifetime or a 20-year appointment you know go ahead and uh, spend what you need to do to to make this happen and you're not at the mercy of political whim exactly here here in bc we have four dominant political parties, two conservative, one kind of mid, you know, sort of center left and one left. And if they all sign on to a multi-generational solution, then it doesn't matter who's in and out of power. They've all agreed to it. So it becomes sort of apolitical. It's, it's outside the political realm now. They agreed to it. It's done. We're all going to do it regardless of who's in power. That That's the way you have right. to do it. So, yeah. It sounds like there's also, uh, you know, there's there's a couple of opportunities. It sounds like there's one opportunity to create new markets for the biomass. So uh, partnering with industry is always a great strategy because things yeah. move at a, at a pretty brisk pace. Mm -hmm. um, informing f forestry companies that are, you know, harvesting timber of here's the physical map. If you, if you could harvest here, it would be much more impactful than if you harvested over here. If you could harvest along this grid network that we've devised in that that's purposed 
to re-separate the stands from continuous canopy, uh, right? It, it wouldn't cost them any more to harvest where you're saying would be more efficient than to harvest where they're harvesting now. Only it could have, you know, m m huge uh, climate impact on protecting the forests, which ultimately is in their interest as well. Exactly. Exactly. And it sounds like there's also a, a big opportunity for philanthropy in here. Yes. You know, because there are multimillionaires and billionaires who have, you know, more dollars than uh, they could ever spend in their lifetimes. Mm -hmm. And they don't have to worry about political expedience or profit. Yeah. And if they can spend it here versus on Mars, that'd be great. So. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, we, we, we're still figuring out how to ruin the, the Mars climate. <laughs> I mean, honestly, like, like if, if, if I was the realtor representing Mars or representing the moon, I'd say, you know, can I get a reference from your previous planet? Yeah, yeah. And uh, based on your record, I'd say, you know, sorry, your yes, application sorry. is denied. Yeah, no, no credit when you for clean you. Up the mess, you know, when you clean up the mess, you know, with your old landlord, then we could talk. That sounds great. Yeah, that's, that's hilarious. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. we're... Um, so, that's that's exactly what we need to do and that's so so we're doing some of that landscape scale modeling right now and you know we have industry partners who are tell us where to go tell us you know we you know we'll we'll work with you and you know it may not be entirely economical or something but you know tell us where to go so that they become the tool that's that's needed you know they're not driving the bus but they are a tool in the, the toolbox that helps us get to where we we as a collective society need to get to so yeah, that's exactly what we need to do. I, I did the math and I don't remember the results, but I, I calculated the the exothermal, you know, heat released by the amount of uh, fires, you know, just in Canada. And when you look at that, the size of those numbers, um, it, you, you'd think it's, it's no surprise that we had the hottest year on record mm -hmm. at the time when we were releasing the most heat ever. Yeah. 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 That's an interesting point. So, uh, and we also emitted far more carbon, uh, through CO2, you know, CO and methane than we have either. So it, it, it far exceeded all of our other emission sources. So, uh, so, uh, I imagine, um, that people who are concerned about this probably should be reaching out to you <laughs> to get information about uh, strategies, tactics, best practices. Uh, Robert, what's the best way to reach you? Uh, you can uh, reach me through social media. I'm still on whatever Twitter is these days. I think it's X. Um, I'm on Blue Sky, LinkedIn. Um, I think I think my contact information for email is on my LinkedIn um, profile, so okay. that's the easiest way to get a hold of me. Okay, great. Well, I hope people do reach out to you, and and I and I hope that uh, you know we find a way to not only publicize but to make palatable uh, the solutions that are required. You know, even if we can get people to say take small steps. Yeah. Uh, and then eventually, you know, eventually run after they, they start crawling. Yeah. Um, yeah. but it, but it, you know, I'm not sure that we have the time to you know, create a campaign to get people to, to support this. Time and time is definitely an but, issue. But I'm not sure that we have a choice. Yeah. Well, no, we don't. We, we, um, we all have to do everything we possibly can, um, with, with this window that we do have, it's not closing, um, but it's close to closing. And um, we have to do everything we possibly can to mitigate things as quickly as we can. Yep. Well, I really appreciate all of the research and the publications and the publicizing of the, both the problem and some very well thought out solutions that you and other fire ecologists have dedicated your lives to to creating. So huge. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you from my, my unborn grandchildren as well, because yeah. uh, I would love it. If there's still a forest for them to enjoy the way we got to. Yeah. Uh, and I, I want to thank you so much for, for joining me on the fire break. And I hope that you'll come back and join me again soon. 
I will for sure. And thank you so much, Steve, for amplifying, you know, the message we're trying to get out there. So thanks to you. We'll keep, we'll keep at it. And this is, this is barely a, a scratch, mm-hmm. you know, but the scratch all hopefully add up. So yeah. thank you again. For sure. All right, folks, this is, it, it's Robert W. Gray. Uh, you can find him the way I did on LinkedIn. Thanks so much for joining us, Robert. And thank you for joining us for this hour of the fire break. The fire break, as you know, is sponsored by team wildfire doing super cool stuff. Look it up at teamwildfire.com and we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks again and take care.